As a girl in STEM, there's always this underlying question of why are you here? It's present every time you hear people joking about the women in STEM or they've made a smirk when you walk into the room. After a while, you start to ask yourself, why am I here? Do I belong here? Once the novelty of hearing that question or seeing that smirk wears off, you begin to realize you really enjoy what you're doing. The real question becomes, why can't you see that I belong here? I'm Venna. I'm Kaylee. And I'm Adele. And we're the captains and assistant captain of FIRST Robotics Team 1816, The Green Machine. While there have been girls in leadership positions as well as captains of our team, this is the first time in our team's 18-year history that both co-captains and the assistant captain are all girls. Each of us spends more than 36 hours a week in the workshop, programming and building a robot alongside 24 other students. We have six to seven weeks of building and iterating before the competition season starts. From early March to mid-May, we compete like crazy in three to four competitions, including the World Championship. As the team's drive coach, I'm constantly negotiating strategy with other teams. In any given match, I'm working with two other teams to try and get as many points as possible. A match is two and a half minutes long. I'm a very logical thinker. What will be the best winning strategy based off of the data that I have? And when I say data, I mean I look at a spreadsheet like what you see here, and I make a decision. My goal is to work with the strengths of our alliance partners because that leads to more positive outcomes. This worked most of the time at competitions in Minnesota, but it was another environment completely at the World Championship. I found myself negotiating with adult men who talked over me constantly and discarded any idea that wasn't their own. What do, why did I need an adult male mentor at my side to get my point across, and what do I need to do to be taken seriously? My main solution has been to ask questions and be engaged in my tasks. There are two hard things about this. One, people are scared to ask questions because they don't want to seem like they don't know the right answer. In reality, though, no one's judging you for not knowing. Two, there's often this misconception that there's only one way to solve a problem in STEM. It's completely untrue. STEM is just as creatively open as humanities and arts. There are many ways to solve a problem, but the only way to find these solutions is to improve your understanding by asking questions. You might be thinking, how does this help you? Well, the more that I ask questions, learn, and come up with the solutions, the less that others can ignore me and push me aside. I joined the team in the shadow of my brother, who was a team captain three years ago. So I started where I was most familiar. I know how to write a business plan, how to represent myself and my team, how to write professionally, and how to teach others to do the same. I found that the team was very comfortable with me as business or non-robot lead. But then I decided to branch out and learn more about the technical aspects of building a robot. I'll be the first to admit, I don't have as much confidence in my technical skills. And I noticed something. There are consistent, ongoing, subtle signs of dismissal and resistance to my presence. Whether it's intentional or not, it makes me question why I am even in the team's workshop. Since there's no room for me to have a learning curve, I lean into the fact that people don't believe I am capable, and I ask questions. I ask rookies questions, I ask my peers questions, I ask mentors questions. I look to women mentors for guidance when my leadership is being questioned. I show up in spite of fear, in spite of people's perspectives of me. I do this all knowing that some people will continue to question if I belong in the workshop, and I will continue to show up and prove to all in the workshop that this is where I belong. During my first year on the team, just last year, we were presented with a challenge. It was essentially to climb a set of monkey bars that gradually increase in height. In my opinion, Building an arm that could scale these heights efficiently and without falling would be no simple mechanism. It had my attention from day one. After two days of brainstorming, I went home with an idea. I built a prototype out of toothpicks, popsicle sticks, and glue. It represented the movement that this ideal climber would make in a real game scenario. I presented it to the team, and it died. I had no reputation on the team. I was just a rookie. I was the new person that thought they were the next best thing. So without team vote and without team input, we ended up going with a senior design team. Days were flying by and decisions were being made. It wasn't until more than a week, than a week into our build season that a mentor took interest in my idea. 
She made me believe my idea was worthwhile and helped me make it into a reality. It's hard to gain traction against an older, male-dominated do team, but success came when it was decided that both climbers would be built and manufactured. During our first competition in early March, after eight weeks of building these robots, it was decided that we would use the seniors climber, and it wasn't until it completely failed, falling off the highest rung in the final match and completely crushing our robot, that we decided to go with my prototype. And it was this arm that helped us win the state championship this year. Whoa. So what can we do to change this? Well, it's all about giving voice and enabling everybody, to the new people, to the rookies, and to those who have yet to prove themselves. I know it's really easy to go with ideas that have worked in the past or to listen to those who have more experience than others, but why miss out on an idea? So I encourage you, look around the room, go to the quiet girl in the corner, ask her about her design, and she may shine. These solutions that we've talked about have all been personal ways that we've learned to overcome that feeling that we don't belong in STEM. We know that there are girls out there like us who experience this in schools, on teams, or in activities. Maybe there are girls who are reluctant to pursue their ideas or dreams because of hearing that question, why are you here, over and over in their heads. Well, if you're facing this issue, there are organizations that can provide guidance through the bias and provide opportunities and advice. There's the National Center for Women in, in Information Technology. There's the Minnesota Aspirations in Computing. And there are local chapters of the Society of Women Engineers. There are many other organizations who provide guidance and support to women in STEM. These are just three in Minnesota. On our robotics team, we work hard to create a safe space for everyone, regardless of gender, sexuality, and race. We ask for everyone's preferred pronouns and their preferred name. We play get to know you games and we start every meeting with icebreakers to get everyone up and talking to each other. This foundation helps us become more comfortable with each other so that we can have deeper conversations about implicit bias. We participate, we speak up, we ask questions, we advocate, and we help us win. We know that we belong in STEM. Now it's your turn to believe it. Stop asking why are you here? We belong today, and we belong in the future. We can only do this with your help. As you've heard from us today, you are powerful in these situations. There are tools and resources to help us change the narrative for women in STEM. So we ask you, show us and tell us that we belong in tech. Let's all keep our eyes on the future. Thank you.